It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'd rather be a door holder. I'd rather be a door holder in his house than every rank, every accolade, every amount of wealth, every amount of power, every amount of influence that this world has to offer. I'd rather be a door holder in his house. My name is Seth. Hi. Hi. Honored to be preaching the word to you tonight. I don't think I have an announcement, do I, Chantel? I don't think so. Praise the Lord. Love it. I love it when I don't have an announcement. Thank you, Lord. We're opening a series tonight called The Arrival as we go into this Christmas season, and I'm very, very excited to preach the word tonight to you. Um, we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 9 as our primary passage tonight. I want to give you a little bit of background before we stand and read it together. Our primary passage <clears throat> comes out of this, this book that we call one of the major prophets. It's known, Isaiah is known as one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. My, uh, my good friend and theologian, Jamie Meyer, he puts it, he summarizes the book of Isaiah like this. It is about God's intentions to restore Israel to right relationship with himself despite their rebellion and rejection of him. It's kind of the theme of the Old Testament, actually. <laughs> this prophetic book contains, contains several prophecies about the Messiah. Now, how many of you have heard the term the Messiah before? You're going to hear that throughout this series, the Messiah. The Messiah is, is a Hebrew adaptation, and it means anointed anointed one. Anointing has to do with oil in a physical sense, but it has to do with being cho chosen and called in a spiritual sense, and specifically by the Holy Spirit. This prophetic book, it contains these prophecies about the Messiah who would deliver the people of God and be their savior king. Familiar with the story? One of the most famous of these prophecies from this book is found in this chapter, Isaiah chapter 9. And it is a passage that you hear a lot at Christmas. Who knew? We'll begin in verse 6. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, will do this. This is God's word. You may be seated. For those of you who don't follow too closely with the church calendar, and I don't mean the heart of the city church calendar, I mean like the big C church calendar. This weekend is the beginning of something called Advent. Have you heard that word before? For many of us, the only context in which we have heard Advent is an Advent calendar, where you count down the days till Christmas, and every day you get a little stale piece of chocolate out of this little plastic cubby. And let's just be real, it's generous to call it chocolate. Some hydrogenated, murky, solidified pond water. Some of you never had an advent calendar, that's okay. It's fine, if you know, you know. But for Christians around the world, advent has meant something much more than that for over a thousand years. Advent is the season encompassing the four weeks leading up to Christmas, which, like I said, it actually begins this weekend as we're beginning this series. The word comes from, from the Latin advenire, meaning to come to. Can you say to come to? And the closest common noun we have for the word in English would be arrival. Can you say arrival? In church history, the season of Advent is marked by a time of preparation. Now, most of us would think about the preparation for remembering the birth of our Savior, the birth of Christ. But actually, in church history, 
it's dual preparation. Advent is a season where we remember and we prepare to celebrate the commemoration of the birth of Christ. And we also prepare our hearts and minds for the next time he comes at the culmination of time. Did you know that Advent isn't just about Christmas? Advent is about us awaiting the coming King. As our preaching team was preparing for the Christmas season this year, we felt led toward the direction of recognizing this season of Advent, and that's what led us to the, the title of this series, The Arrival. Now, there are two arrivals that have occurred in my life that I will always remember. One of those has to do with my wife, Micaiah. I love that woman, my goodness. This week, actually, we celebrated, um, it, it's been 10 years since we got engaged this week. It was November 30th, 2013, that we got engaged. About a, about a month and some change after that day, my, li- my wife got on a plane and went to a discipleship training school for Youth with a Mission, also known as YWAM. Any YWAMers in the house? You guys are definitely a tribe. It's cool, my wife's a part of it, I affirm you. I affirm you YWAMers. She went on this DTS, is what they call it, discipleship training school, to New Zealand and an island chain called Vanuatu. And it was for five months. Let me just paint that picture for you again. We got engaged, and then a month and a week later, she left for five months. Now, for, I wasn't going to share this. (laughs) Well, let's just be real. For all intents and purposes of staying pure during engagement, five months is great. Five months in another nation? That's great accountability. Some of you are frowning at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, and you can wipe the religiousness off right now. Now, for other purposes, it was really hard. It was, for my, let's see, how old was I? I guess I was 21, 22, 21 and 22 during those five months. It was like the hardest, most trying, most stressful time of my life up to that point. I'm going to say up to that point. But it was also some of the most edifying and maturing and important time of my life. It really was, looking back on it now. I mean, you couldn't have told me that then. Some people tried to give me prophetic words then about how important and good it was, and I was like, give me a break. (laughs) She returned to the U.S. on June 1st, 2014. I have that etched in my brain. June 1st, 2014. I was standing right outside the security checkpoint at the Spokane airport, and I had roses in my hand. And I knew she was coming in just a few minutes, and I was preparing, and the anticipation was palpable. I was just like, I was like a horse ready to just, you know, like at the race, you know, whatever. (laughs) The racetrack. All right. But when I saw her, I, I couldn't, oh yeah, there's my father-in-law back there. He was, he's explaining, he's telling the real story. Uh, um, I couldn't even, I couldn't even deliver the flowers. I couldn't deliver the roses. As soon as I caught a glimpse of her, I threw the roses on the ground, threw them on the ground. I'm like, who cares? And I sprinted toward her and picked her up and gave her the biggest bear hug that you can think of. I had been preparing for that moment. I thought I was ready for it. But the reality of her arrival was different than I expected. The second arrival I'll never forget. September 6th, Labor Day, 2021. My son was born. I had been told by so many different people what to expect. So many different people going, oh, this is what it's like to be a dad. This is what it's like to see, to see your first child born. <laughs> and I, I was preparing. Now, my wife was preparing at a whole nother level, <laughs> obviously. But in my heart and in my mind, I was preparing. And I, I, 
I thought I had an idea of what that moment was gonna be like. I had no idea. The closest thing that I can compare it to, and even this is not even that good of a comparison, but I remember when I was a little boy, probably six or seven years old, and I climbed into an apple tree, and I slipped, and I fell, and I hit my back on the ground, and I couldn't catch my breath. That's the closest thing I can compare it to when I saw my son first come out of the womb. I literally gasped. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was a miracle. It is a miracle. We were prepared. But the reality of his arrival was different than I expected. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, those two arrivals are really special to me. It's okay if you're just sitting there and be like, okay, well, that, that's cool for you, Seth, but I get it. But there were... Uh, Honestly, as special and as precious as those two arrivals are, they still pale in comparison to the arrival that I want to talk to you about tonight. They pale. Just so you know, I just want to make it clear. As much as I adore my wife and my, and my son, they do not rank equal or above my king. I know that there may be someone out there who thinks that you're being noble by valuing your family over God, but you're not being noble. You're shipwrecking your family. When you get them out of order, you put them on a pedestal that they will never be able to satisfy. Now, tonight it might be hard. It might be hard for us to put ourselves in the shoes of ancient Israel in the time that Jesus came. But I want you to just try to think about what this people had been through as they awaited the coming of their Messiah. About 930 years before Jesus was born, the kingdom of Israel was split into two. How many of you guys know that? About 930 years before he was born, the kingdom of Israel was split into two. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel, and the southern kingdom took on the name of the tribe that David was from, his bloodline, which was Judah. Now, as soon as the kingdom split, things immediately went awry. The northern kingdom lasted about 200 years before it was taken into captivity by a nation called Assyria. The southern kingdom then lasted about 130 more years after the northern kingdom fell. And then they came under Babylonian rule. And eventually a large portion of them were actually exiled, taken outside of their land to the nation of Babylon. From that point on, the Jews would be subjected to oppression from several different foreign powers until when Jesus was born, they were under the rule of arguably the most famous empire in history, which was Rome. Now, the passage that we read from Isaiah chapter 9, it's believed to have been composed between the falls of the northern empire and the southern empire. I want to dig into this passage to hopefully unfold a little bit of its prophetic significance for what we're talking about tonight. So we're gonna go back to verse six of chapter nine. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Right from the get-go, we learn something significant about the Messiah. He's gonna be a man. And he's gonna be born a baby. Now, some of you might be like, that's old news. We get it, we've celebrated Christmas for years. But these truths are so important and they wouldn't be taken for granted by ancient Israel because the genuine humanity of Jesus is essential to his role as the perfect sacrifice for our sin, the perfect example for human life and the first fruits of the resurrection. It was deeply important that Jesus came as man and that he had the full human experience. It then says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. This speaks to the authority and even the kingship of the Messiah. This wording, along with several other messianic prophecies, led Israel to this, the expectation of a Messiah who would be a conquering king that would deliver them from their earthly oppressors. It says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here we need to be aware that in ancient Israel, when it talks about someone's name, they weren't just referring to their literal name. It was a part of their culture that when you said name, you spoke of someone's character. You spoke of someone's essence. You spoke of who they were. These descriptions make it clear that although the Messiah will be a man, he will not be merely a man. He will be God. How could someone be prophesied to be a man born a baby, but also almighty God? This is the mystery that we find in Jesus. It goes on to finish like this. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Again, Isaiah returns to the, to the idea of the Messiah's authority and the language of kingship here is even more explicit than before. See, the reference to David is extremely important because God had made a covenant with David that he would establish his throne forever. And through the Messiah, he would fulfill that covenant. Jesus would be born in the line of David and he would be the fulfillment of the eternal kingdom. That being said, this Messiah would be greater than David for he would not only be king, he would be God. Now, when we look at the language of Isaiah chapter nine, and we see how much it's talking about government, about ruling, about authority, it's hard for us to blame ancient Israel for looking to this coming Messiah, that he would arrive as a great governmental or military leader to deliver them from foreign oppressors in a natural sense. That being said, there were also messianic prophecies that painted a much different picture. I wanna to read to you from the same book, Isaiah, the same prophet, but much later. Listen to this description of the coming Messiah. Chapter 53, verse three. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. A little bit different tone than chapter nine. See, this is actually a theme in the book of Isaiah. The first roughly half of Isaiah, we read prophetic literature about the Messiah that paints him as victorious, as conquering, and as king. And then as we go into the latter half of Isaiah, we are given the picture of the Messiah as a suffering servant. For those of you who are not acquainted with the story of Jesus, he was largely rejected by the nation of Israel. The Romans technically crucified him, but it was only at the urging of the Jewish people who were incited by their religious leaders. I'm gonna say that again. The Romans technically crucified Jesus, but it was only at the urging of Israel, at the incitement of their religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to be shepherding them and preparing them for their Messiah. Israel may have thought that they were prepared for their Messiah to come, but the reality of his arrival was different from what they expected. So different that they not only failed to receive him as their promised deliverer, but they had him killed as a heretic, as a blasphemer, as a sinner. Ironically, 
their failure to receive him was actually part of the prophetic fulfillment for him and for them. Here's my question for you. How could it be that Israel grasped the Messiah as conquering king and missed him as suffering servant? How did they misunderstand his arrival so deeply that when he arrived, they discarded him? To answer that question, I think we need to do a little bit of internal reflection. Here comes the spice. We're not gonna go a whole sermon without me doing that. I'm sorry, it's just not who I am. Just remember I love you and I'm not mad at you. How many of us affirm the parts of Jesus and his word? Because when you try to separate from his word, you try to separate Jesus from his word. There is, there, there is a day coming where that tragic miscalculation will be exposed for what it is. How many of us affirm the parts of Jesus and his word that we perceive as beneficial to us? We need a king to deliver us. And then we reject the parts of him that are difficult to understand or accept. How many of us 2,000 years later are still tragically misunderstanding the significance of his arrival and subtly rejecting the fullness of Christ? Let it be known to you to reject, to reject Jesus in part is to reject him completely. Interestingly enough, the part of Jesus that we struggle to accept, we as in us in 2023, today is often the opposite of what ancient Israel failed to accept about him. I'm gonna say that again. Please follow me. Interestingly enough, the part of Jesus that we struggle to accept today is often the opposite of what ancient Israel failed to accept about him. You see, many of us are okay with the idea of our Messiah suffering on our behalf, dying for our sins, reconciling us to God and giving us eternal life. Why? Because it sounds like a benefit. But we struggle with accepting him as Lord and as king. I love the United States of America. I wouldn't rather raise my children anywhere else in this world. But sometimes I feel that we have gotten so used to living in a constitutional republic, which I believe is actually a really good idea for government, but that's an aside. We have gotten so used to living in a constitutional republic, which by the way, that's what the United States of America is, it's not a democracy. Sometimes I feel that we've gotten so used to living in a constitutional republic that we think the head of state in the kingdom of God is a president who can be voted in and out based on whether his policies represent the preferences of the populace. I'm gonna say that again. We have gotten so used to living in a constitutional republic that we think the head of state in the kingdom of God is a president who can be voted in and out based on whether his policies represent the preferences of the populace. I hope this isn't news to you, but Jesus is not the president. He's the king. And as such, he is not subject to your evaluation of his policies. You don't get to be the arbiter. He has never asked for your vote. Instead, he has commanded your wholehearted allegiance because he's a king. You don't bow down to a king whenever you agree with something he says or does. You bow down to a king when he walks into the room. And he's in the room. Ancient Israel was ready to receive a king. They were. Ancient Israel was ready to receive a king, but they overlooked the truth that that king had to suffer. The postmodern world can receive a suffering servant. Works great. But many of us have been misled to think that we have no need of a king. A king would restrict us. 
A king would mean that there is an authority higher than us. A king would encroach on my personal will and autonomy. But the truth is the gospel is not just that Jesus died and paid the penalty for your sin and made a way for you to have eternal life. The gospel is also that he rose again, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and that he is reigning until every enemy has been put under his feet. Here's the thing that we need to catch, American church. It's good news that he's the king. It's good news that he's the king. It's not just good news that he died for our sins. It's good news that he's the king because he's the best kind of king. He's a king who understands your weakness. He's a king who loves you with the highest form of love. He's a king who laid down his life for you. He's a king who holds the keys of death and hell. He's a king who sees you and treats you as his beautiful bride because you are that. He is wonderful. He is counselor. He is mighty God. He is everlasting Father. He is Prince of Peace. It's good news that he's the King. The question for you is this. Will you receive him as he is? Or will you reject him because he's different from what you think he should be? Will you say, you know, I like his policies on this, but I'm just not sure I can get on board with that. Will you receive him as both suffering servant and victorious king, or will you miss the day of your visitation? Will he weep over you as he did Jerusalem, who missed their shot when he was with them in the flesh? Ancient Israel made a tragic miscalculation when they rejected their Messiah. Don't make the same mistake. Today is the day of your visitation. I'm gonna say that again. Today is the day of your visitation and he doesn't owe you another one. 